Thank you for joining me for another episode of Awaken Empower TV. I'm your host, Ethan Fox. Today I'm joined by futurist Steve McDonald. We discussed the different stages of human civilization and as it evolves over time, uh, what kind of characteristics it embodies during those times, where we are now in that cycle, and what we can expect in the next several decades of human evolution. We also discussed the impact of psychedelics uh, and what effect that has on human consciousness. A lot of very interesting topics. So without any further delay, here's Steve McDonald. Hello, Steve. Welcome to Awaken Empower TV. It's a pleasure to have you here with me today. And I'm looking forward to learning more about you and the different areas where you have expertise and you've done a lot of research. Um, well, first of all, tell me where, where are you calling from today? I'm calling from Byron Bay, which is a, a small country town uh, about two hours south of Brisbane in Australia on the East Coast. And let's start by talking about your background um, in, that led into the work that you're doing now and the, the subjects we're going to be covering today. Anything relevant, any education you've had that would give us a good foundation? Sure. Um, I grew up in Sydney and uh, I was fortunate to live near a national park. So even though I grew up in the city, I was quite close to nature and used to spend a lot of time in nature. And uh, I joined the army at age 19 and trained as an officer and then as a helicopter pilot. So I spent about five years uh, flying reconnaissance helicopters in the army. And after a few years of that work, I felt really drawn to work with teams of people. So um, fairly unusually, I asked for a career change uh, to the infantry, which is the, um, the mainstream combat part of the army. And then spent the rest of my 15 year army career as an infantry officer, uh, which I enjoyed thoroughly because it, it uh, involved um, managing people under extreme circumstances and uh, I, I was at that age you know, very attracted to uh, understanding more about human nature uh, and I went to war in Africa and Somalia in 1993 uh, as a major in an infantry battalion uh, which was a, a life-changing experience and then after uh, my war experience or really during my war experience I felt that my time in the army was done it was like you know whatever I had needed to achieve there I had so I made the decision to move on and within about 18 months uh, I left the army um, but interestingly I, I had no real direction that I, I wanted to go in uh, so I just had a, a deep intuition that I should leave uh, which I followed and then uh, I ended up getting offered some flying work I'd been out of flying at that stage for about eight years and uh, was offered a helicopter job in Sydney uh, took that and left the army and uh, then went through a couple of short-term jobs, just a, a general charter work job in Sydney. And then I spent 12 months uh, flying tourists around the Great Barrier Reef up at Heron Island, which was a, a wonderful break from what I had been doing. Uh, and then I, I really, I guess I was a, a, an adrenaline junkie after you know, spending so much time in the army and being at war. And um, I was attracted to doing emergency services work. So a job came up flying a rescue helicopter in Mackay, Queensland. And uh, I took that and did that for five years, which was very interesting work. And um, at the time, I, I got married very young. I was married at age 20. And my wife was clairvoyant. So uh, for the 23-some years that we were together, I had that aspect, you know, very close to me in my life of being having access to someone who was quite psychic. Uh, which intrigued me and uh, taught me a lot about the nature of reality and uh, the process of manifesting things and why you know some predictions would come true and some wouldn't and, and what part I played in that process. Uh, and um, while I was flying the rescue helicopter, I, I felt a little bit uh, under-challenged intellectually, so I ended up starting some part-time work as a, a trainer and management consultant. Uh, which grew and after five years of flying that, that helicopter, I decided to change careers again and uh, I left flying and went into consulting full time. Um, so while I was flying the rescue helicopter, I was living in a, a regional town in Queensland uh, in the tropics and I uh, had bought a small uh, orchard on five acres. So I was living in a country in a very beautiful setting with my family and uh, a new pilot came to town to work with me and his wife was a professional clairvoyant who had her own radio show and uh, they were meditators and my wife and I became good friends with them and they introduced us to meditation 
and uh, also to some very interesting channel books and those sorts of things, which I had never been attracted to before. Um, and in the same year, I also started practicing Tai Chi Chuan, which is a, a Taoist Kung Fu system, uh, which is basically moving meditation. So I'd thrown myself uh, deeply into uh, meditative practice on a regular basis. And I had a, a spontaneous spiritual awakening, uh, simply sitting on the couch uh, at home one day, uh, reading a channel book, and it was like somebody flicked a light switch. Um, I just had this realization that, you know, what I was reading was, was based in uh, fact. And um, I guess I, I, it, it gave me a, a kind of multidimensional awareness um, of other dimensions and, and triggered a deep interest in spirituality. So I went on a very steep learning curve uh, after that happened. Um, and I, I had a lot of change happening around me at that time. Uh, my marriage broke up and uh, I moved into state and I set up an office in Melbourne to continue my consulting work. Um, and I had also been suffering from post-traumatic stress from a combination of my war service and my work in emergency services and also a traumatic experience that I'd had at a very young age, about 15 months. Uh, and that all caught up with me. I ended up um, having a breakdown going into hospital in Melbourne for a while and I was unable to work for seven months. And I went through a conventional treatment process for post-traumatic stress, which worked to a small extent, but, but not very well. Um, but one of the things that did for me was it really freed me up. And, and I realized that it wasn't just a, a breakdown I was going through, but it was actually a breakthrough. Um, and by that time, I'd been working in the personal development field enough to understand about the change process and to be able to see what was happening to me. Um, and I decided that I, I was free to really reshape my working career however I wanted to because I'd been forced to stop my consulting work at that time. And uh, when I, I restarted, uh, I decided to, to focus my work uh, on my spiritual path as best I could. So around the same time I had my breakdown in Melbourne, uh, I was introduced to a couple of bodies of really interesting work. The first one was Ken Wilber's Integral Theory, and then secondly, uh, a book called Spiral Dynamics, which uh, was a book about human nature, and it was mostly based on the research of an American professor of psychology called Claire W. Graves, who'd been teaching psychology at Schenectady, uh, sorry, at uh, Schenectady in upstate New York at Union College. And um, in the process of his teaching, he would teach about five different theories of psychology, which were popular at the time. Inevitably, at the end of uh, each of his courses, a student would ask the question, Dr. Graves, you've taught us these five different theories. Which one's right? Um, and uh, he was a contemporary of Abraham Maslow, who is a fairly well-known psychologist and uh, actually knew Maslow and knew about his hierarchy of human needs. And he was curious enough to, to want to do his own research to try and answer this question, you know, which one of these theories was right. Um, so he did a nine-year study uh, and studied over a 1,000 people for that period and mapped out uh, a really complex set of data which basically uh, described the worldviews of the people he was studying and how those worldviews changed over time. Uh, also, what happened when people went through a major transformation and, and what that felt like. And he discovered this interesting link between the complexity of life conditions and the adaptive nature of human consciousness. And, and as life conditions became more complex, consciousness seemed to adapt and operate in more complex ways accordingly. So um, both of those pieces of work, integral theory and, and spiral dynamics from Kelly Graves, uh, really captured me. And uh, I threw myself into a, an informal study process, which went on for many years. Because uh, Graves had actually died in 1986 before he published his work, so he's, he's not well known at all. And it's pretty difficult, if not impossible, to study his work through the formal education system. Uh, so I really was limited to uh, doing some training with the authors of the Spiral Dynamics book, which I, I did here in Australia and also in Texas. And then... Uh, self-paced study basically for many years uh, combined with uh, references to my own uh, practical experience of life. Um, <clears throat> eventually I um, 
got to the point of organising the world's first formal train the trainer spiral dynamics course uh, and together with uh, Christopher Cook from the UK uh, we ran that in my office in Melbourne and so uh, I was also a student as well as an organizer of that course and um, after that I started teaching spiral dynamics um, and and then again spent further years uh, studying Claire Graves' uh, research data. So around that time uh, that I had my, my first breakdown in Melbourne, uh, I also joined uh, a mystery school soon afterwards, uh, the Rosicrucian Order, uh, which I'm still a member of, and I found that quite valuable uh, from a spiritual education point of view and also learning more about uh, meditative practice. Um, and uh, in 2005, I had, um, I had a bit of a... A change on the work front in that I started a new company which was going to specialize specifically in change work, uh, consulting around change and organizational development using Claire Graves' work as a primary tool. And uh, I had two uh, lady friends who joined as non executive directors uh, and helped me start the company, one of whom was a medium. And uh, during one of our early business meetings, she channeled a message. Uh, in fact, she channeled a few messages over a number of different meetings. The first one was from an ascended master called Kutumi. And then after a few messages came through, it progressed to channeling from Metatron. And the messages were essentially about a big shift in consciousness which was coming uh, in the world and the need to establish a network of uh, change makers and guides who would help uh, shepherd humanity through this tremendous shift that was coming. Um, <clears throat> and it, the message seemed to be very much about practically establishing a, a network in a grounded way and some kind of global coordination of assistance to smooth the change process on a large scale. And uh, even though I'd, I'd been married to a clairvoyant for many years and I'd had a lot of access to channel material, um, I also was very grounded from you know, my time in the army and uh, all of the, the mainstream work that I was still doing. Um, so I kind of took it as uh, like a, I took it with a grain of salt and uh, I didn't dismiss it at all, but I put it aside and I, I just thought to myself, well, you know, we'll see what comes of that. Um, but I, I held the message and over the years I found that, you know, things would start to drop into place. And so, um, that still seems to be happening. You know, that, that seems to be progressing and, and my work is now fairly solidly oriented towards setting up that network and, in fact, it's, it's starting to, to happen already. So another significant thing that happened uh, around that time in my life, this was 2006 now, um, I got invited to an ayahuasca ceremony uh, by a, a close friend who was working in the same area that I was working in. And, uh, in fact, he was the same uh, friend who introduced me to spiral dynamics and integral theory, uh, a, a dear friend called Ron Laurie. And uh, Ron rang me up and said, I've just been invited to an ayahuasca ceremony. Would you like to come? And, and I said, what's ayahuasca? And uh, I had to get on Google and, and figure out what that was all about. Um, and Ron had grown up uh, with some exposure to psychedelics in Scotland and, and he felt that they had potential use as tools to support the change process. So the two of us uh, decided to, to go along and attend this ceremony and uh, that was absolutely life-changing. Um, by that time, I'd been meditating for seven years, so I felt I was fairly well prepared for the experience and I uh, found it reasonably easy, easy to navigate the, uh, the altered state. Um, and I really um, had a wonderful introduction in that first journey to the potential of psychedelics to support transformational change and also for healing work. So that started a long-term interest in, in altered states uh, and connected to healing and, and transformation. Um, and um, I continued my consulting work and a, a few years later, it was, it was, I guess it was early 2009, uh, a friend advised me to go on a retreat with some Ecuadorian shaman uh, overseas, which I did. And, uh, and again, you know, that was a, a significant turning point in my understanding of that kind of work and its usefulness and it also uh, brought up a bit of a healing crisis for me and later that year I had a second breakdown from post-traumatic stress and went into hospital again and um, 
again, I saw it as a, a breakthrough rather than a breakdown and, and a clear opportunity to adjust my path. Um, and so I made a tree change. Uh, being in hospital enforcement to stop my consulting work and, and again, you know, I felt fairly free to, to change whatever I wanted to. So I moved from Melbourne quite soon after I got out of hospital to this area where I'm living now, the Byron Bay area. Uh, which is a very big alternative lifestyle centre in Australia. It has lots of progressive stuff going on. Uh, and um, once I got up here, I really threw myself into understanding altered state work more deeply and how that could be useful to support the transformation process for people and also for deep healing. Um, and uh, I, as a result of a, ris- a visit to Australia by American researcher Rick Doblin, who started the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, um, myself and a few others were prompted to start a research organisation here in Australia called Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. And so uh, we formed that in 2011 and uh, I'm still involved as a volunteer board member with PRISM, as we call it. Um, and we're look, working closely with MAPS and uh, even after about six years, we're still trying to establish some psychedelic research here in Australia. It's been quite a slow road. Uh, but that seems to be the case in many countries because uh, there's a lot of uh, social stigma and taboo to, to overcome in relation to the use of drugs as medicines. Around about uh, the same time, 2011, I started public speaking uh, on Graves' work and its relationship to the changes that were going on in the world. In other words, using his theory as a means of uh, decoding you know, what we were seeing happening around the world and understanding the dynamic that were at play. Um, and I got invited to speak also on a, a tour called the Origins of Consciousness Tour in 2012 uh, with uh, Dennis McKenna and um, Graham Hancock, the author, and Mitch Schultz, who's a, a filmmaker who made the documentary DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And so I travel Australia with that crew, um, speaking mostly about the uh, process of establishing psychedelic research here and its application particularly to the treatment of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and then around that time, well, soon after 2012, I, I again um, was guided, spiritually guided to uh, change my uh, activity slightly and, and I was directed to start working overseas. And so from early 2014 onwards, I started travelling to initially Texas in the US where Mitch was based and uh, Mitch and I also had a, a, a common interest in establishing some kind of a network to support the consciousness shift that was coming through. He'd also been guided to do the same thing. So we didn't really know how that was going to happen, but uh, in the process of figuring that out, I started helping him put together a couple of psychedelic documentary films. Um, and also uh, Mitch started introducing me to his quite vast network because his film had been fairly successful, he had contacts right around the world and uh, some very interesting people doing interesting things. And I found that quite useful. And one of the, the people that led me to connect with was uh, a, an ex-US Navy pilot called John Peterson who runs a think tank called the Arlington Institute. And John left the military in 1989 and started working as a futurist back in the days when there probably weren't too many futurists around and uh, since then has uh, done a lot of work through the Arlington Institute and um, um, got quite a solid reputation globally. And uh, so I went to visit John in West Virginia and he and I got on quite well. We had the, the common background of being military pilots and, um, and, now, uh, and now I'm speaking regularly in West Virginia at a series of talks that he runs called the Berkeley Springs Transition Talks. And in fact, I'll be there on May 13 this year uh, talking about evolutionary tension and and why the world seems to be uh, going backwards to some extent at the moment. So I guess that brings me to the present day and uh, as well as speaking uh, about Claire Graves' work in relation to the world and the changes that are happening, I'm also just in the early stages of writing a book on the topic. Um, And I'm also, I'm working with some friends uh, who, again, have a connection to the the global network idea. Um, 
Uh, my, my friend John Brevard, who has been working as a jeweler in New York, um, originally trained as a, uh, an architect, uh, particularly in uh, sustainable structures uh, design. And um, he and some friends have started a project to build a centre in Iceland. Uh, the project is called the One Project. And uh, John has had a vision that he's carried for quite a number of years to build centres in certain places around the world, futuristic buildings that could serve as hubs to support a global network um, that would you know, collaborate again to, to try and smooth this very large transition that we're just beginning right now. Uh, so that was another little piece of this uh, puzzle around the network that fell into place just in the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess that's a decent summary of what I'm up to. And I also spend a lot of time just keeping tabs on what's going on in the world and new technology emerging and those sorts of things. So what are the practical apps? You know, so you're offering this training program in the research work done by Claire Graves. What's the practical application for that, that people would want to go through that? It has a really wide scope of application. Basically, it's about human nature. Uh, so it can help people understand the change process that occurs when uh, you go through a major transition in life. And also, Claire Graves' work really came up with three um, significant findings. The first one was this relationship between the complexity of life conditions and the capacity of human consciousness to adapt to operate in more complex ways. Uh, in other words, as life becomes more complex and the challenges you face become more difficult to solve, then it reaches a tipping point where people will go through a transformational change process and arrive at a, a place of being able to think and operate and be in more complex and capable ways. And uh, Claire Graves began to map out those stages that reflected the before and after state of change. And by the time he had passed away, he'd mapped eight different stages uh, of human development, which um, very interestingly re represented a kind of fractal pattern that uh, occurs at different scales. So you can look at the life of an individual from uh, an infant through early childhood and teen life and adult life and see how the changes occur and what the nature of the changes are from stage to stage. The same pattern applies to the evolution of uh, humanity. And you can look at our progress from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle through tribalism and warlike behavior uh, and so on and see the same pattern unfolding. Um, so it's an extremely useful model in that sense and uh, um, in combination with understanding the process of change and being able to map your own change and assist other people through change and understanding what the phases are as you, you go through change and what can be useful at, at different places. So it's really, it's general information about human nature and it can be applied to, to anything that humans do. Well, tell me about the different stages as it applies to our human civilization. What does each stage represent and what kind of what kind of evolution takes place at that time? And uh, maybe if you can give us a reference point of where in our recorded history each of those stages occurred, that would give us a pretty good background, I think. Sure, sure. So the first stage that Graves mapped in his research work was uh, what he termed an automatic stage, which re reflected a hunter-gatherer kind of lifestyle where all of our, our time and effort was really taken up um, simply surviving and relating with a small group or clan of people. And that also equated to uh, life as a, an infant in early childhood when we're really just eating and sleeping and not doing much more. And then the second stage uh, swung from being an individualistic kind of existence uh, at hunter-gatherer to a communal type of existence in a tribe. And that alternation between individualistic behaviour and communal behaviour uh, continued on up through the stages. So tribal life uh, reflects at an individual level early fam family life where we're primarily relating to the key figures in our family or extended family and uh, learning what the, the customs are within the family, what we should and shouldn't do and how to behave. 
um, and at a, at a species level then it was you know the beginning of tribal life where we started to gather together in larger groups of maybe up to 150 people uh, and relate to that larger group and you know, develop shared customs um, and practices and it also equated to the beginning of the explosion of culture in history so um, I think you know, historically, roughly about 50,000 years ago, we saw uh, a sudden explosion of art uh, and crafts and those sorts of things. Um, and then the third stage swings back to individualistic behaviour and it reflects an egocentric, warlike or, or power-oriented type of existence. And you can equate that to that stage usually, um, I, I guess, from... Uh, Sometimes in early childhood through the teen years, it slowly develops uh, where we want us to break out from the restrictions of family life and uh, we're sick of being told what to do by our parents and we want to start being independent and discover who we are in the world and our own power. And at a species level, uh, that was reflected in uh, people breaking out of the tribal restrictions. So uh, perhaps a young, strong person who decided that he was probably smarter than the chief of the tribe uh, and who wanted to do his own thing, so leaves the tribal boundaries, uh, maybe takes some people with him and then makes up his own rules and, uh, and lives according to uh, power. Um, and uh, probably one of the, the most spectacular figures uh, in that respect in history is Genghis Khan, who conquered pretty much most of the world. Um, then the fourth stage swings back to communal living again and it reflects the time in history when the agricultural revolution occurred which allowed people to gather together in larger groups. So you saw the, the birth of uh, large towns and cities for the first time and coming together and living like that meant that we required stricter rules uh, and you know, a guide of how to live life um, in, in such a large group. Um, and so the rise of uh, civilization, as we know it really, um, occurred around that time. And Graves called this uh, stage for absolutistic because people who were living according to that stage tended to look for guidance from a higher authority and then to follow a rule set. Um, so around the same time in history, um, this particular worldview birthed what we know as the major religions where the higher authority was a God and there was a, a rule book as in the Bible or the Quran or something like that, which told us how to live and, and gave us commandments indeed uh, in terms of what we should and shouldn't do. And the kind of thinking that emerged uh, from stage four was consequently quite linear, very black and white. You were either with the rules or against them. Um, and, uh, of course, some of the great civilizations, uh, such as the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks and, and, uh, and similar, came out of that particular way of living. Um, it's a little hard to pin it exactly to uh, times in history, but certainly um, this was, you know, how it had emerged by four or five uh, thousand years ago. And probably, I think, as there's a lot of new history being discovered at the moment, which is rewriting the books, uh, and we're discovering... Um, old civilizations that had you know, very spectacular construction capacities and those sorts of things. So they would reflect this fourth stage of uh, absolutistic uh, living. And then, um, so, so if you think about stage four also as the agricultural era, you know, it didn't end all that long ago. And, and uh, the fifth stage, which Graves called multiplistic because uh, in the move from four to five, thinking changed from being very linear in stage four to uh, being able to consider multiple options in stage five and develop strategies and processes for experimenting and choosing which was the best option out of many. Uh, and so that reflects the modern paradigm, which is really still dominant in the world right now. And as, as late as uh, the American Civil War, people were still fighting over uh, modern values and agricultural values. So um, the transition from stage three to four, uh, we know took thousands of years to spread around the world and right through this process, the speed of change is generally very relevant to the speed of communication. So the faster that people can spread their new ideas and insights and the faster things change. And 
that uh, agricultural stage went on for many thousands of years, primarily because the, the communication process was so slow back then. Um, and with the emergence of uh, things like the, the scientific and industrial revolutions, the European Enlightenment, um, earlier than that, the invention of the, the printing press, we obtained uh, faster means of communication. Uh, and, and so this new, uh, more complex, modern way of thinking emerged. Uh, and it's been around for a few hundred years now um, and it's still dominant, but it's in, it is in the late stages of, uh, of its time in terms of dominating the world. Um, and so if you look back over those stages, what we can see is that the stages that progressively dominated humanity's existence for shorter periods of time, uh, quite long uh, back in the hunter-gatherer stage, um, possibly a couple hundred thousand years, uh, and then tribalism, um, you know, just certainly uh, some 10,000 years or, or so, maybe longer. Um, Warlike behaviour, shorter again. Uh, Agricultural-based behaviour, shorter again, but still, still in the thousands of years uh, span. And then when we go to the modern stage, we're looking at just hundreds of years that this uh, particular paradigm has dominated the world. And right at the moment, uh, by my measuring, we are in transition between this fifth stage and a sixth stage, which swings us back to communal living again. So obviously the, the modern lifestyle has been very individualistic. Uh, and that sixth stage, uh, Graves called relativistic because he noted that people who were living from that place had the capacity to take multiple perspectives on things and they could really quite literally imagine what it's like to be in someone else's shoes and, and look at something from their perspective and not their own. Um, and, and more recently, you know, some people have called it postmodernism, um, but I'm not sure that postmodernism fully captures the essence of stage six because it hasn't really fully emerged yet and so we haven't seen it in full flight with its uh, technology in place. But stage six brings a very humanistic way of viewing the world. And so things are, are often interpreted in accordance with their impact on human beings and human values. It's extremely network centric. So um, it likes to uh, build its own network and have a reference group of peers. And in fact, its, its values are, are quite different to any previous value sets that we've seen in that they can they can appear to be quite movable. And what Graves found is the core of the values at this sixth stage or postmodern stage is really uh, human connection. So the central aspect is human connection, wanting to connect with another human being quite deeply. And the the actual values that are demonstrated in behaviour um, then are put together through this reference network that we have. So by checking in with everybody else and finding out what their values are and then finding our own values as a result of that referencing process. And what that can look like is um, to somebody who comes from a different value set, it can look confusing and it can look uh, maybe even hypocritical because people seem to be changing their values, but, but the core remains steady, which is this process of referencing a peer group um, and maintaining strong connections, that really is, is uh, what it's driven by. Um, and you can see quite clearly how the, our life conditions have changed through this journey, uh, up through the, the six stages as I've explained so far. And um, every one of these stages or paradigms allows us to solve the problems that we are facing at that particular time. But in the process of living according to a new paradigm, the paradigm itself creates new, more complex problems uh, simply because it leads us to, to live in more complex ways uh, with, with more complex technologies. And so the fifth stage, the modern paradigm, has brought us all of this amazing uh, electronic technology, particularly for communication and social networking, uh, yet the complexity that's created by um, giving us all access to a vast global network has meant that the modern paradigm's way of operating just can't solve the problems that we face anymore. And so that evolutionary tension is driving our transition right at the moment to 
uh, a more complex place where we can think in more complex ways in this particularly in this relativistic way where we can put ourselves in other people's shoes within this vast global network and imagine what it must be like uh, to be you know in a war zone in the Middle East or what it must be like to live in uh, northern Europe or Africa uh, and in fact to see those things you know on our, on our telephone or on our uh, computer um, and uh, we are at the moment entering deep into a change process and so this is where Claire Graves' understanding and mapping of the change process uh, comes to the fore. And, and what he found, I might just go into that momentarily and then I'll take you up to the, to the remaining stages uh, after I just explain the change process, which, which the world is really deeply in right now. Um, what happens, if you just imagine that uh, our life conditions are always trending towards higher complexity and if we look at the known universe, it seems that uh, is, is a, a steady thing is that things are slowly becoming more complex you know what began as a as a fairly raw universe um, that that was expanding has evolved into that have evolved plant life and animal life and those sorts of things and so this com trending complexity is always there humans tend to want to hang on to stability so when we uh, arrive at a place of stability, we, we tend to say, okay, now this works, let's just keep living like this. Um, but what happens inevitably is that we become, become out of step because the background life conditions are becoming more complex, we're staying stable. And so we wake up one morning thinking, you know, um, something's changed. Uh, life just doesn't seem to be as easy as it used to be. Uh, you know, and I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I just feel like something's not right. And so that's the first sign that we get that we're going through a change process and the first sign that we get that we need to adapt in some way to different conditions. Um, and then that progresses uh, to the next stage and how that unfolds is we kind of think, okay, if what I've been doing isn't working for me, uh, maybe if I go back to what used to work in the past, then it'll fix everything. So there's this tendency to, to make a regressive search Let's go back to the way things used to be because that used to work um, and, and maybe that'll fix our problems. And, and this is exactly what we're seeing globally right at the moment with the resurgence of nationalism um, and uh, regressive policies, which are, you know, like shutting countries down and, and uh, reducing our communication and sharing processes and those sorts of things. So this regressive search phase has un just re fairly recently unfolded at a global level. And... <clears throat> I thought for years, you know, Grace never really wrote in his work why the regressive search happened. And I pondered it for years and I eventually realised that it's actually a very effective evolutionary mechanism because the, the motivation or the fuel for the change process comes from the gap between our life conditions and the complexity of our life conditions and where we are operating from. And so the, if you imagine an elastic band between my hands there, as the life conditions become more complex, the elastic band stretches and gives us actually more fuel or more uh, impetus for change. Um, and then if we make a regressive search and go backwards at a particular critical time, we're actually um, stretching the elastic band further ourselves. And so what happens eventually is a tipping point is reached when that stretch is sufficient then all of a sudden there'll be a sudden adaptive change uh, and that can happen very rapidly. And so we're going through that stretching process right now where we've sensed that something's not right, we've sent that, sensed that something has, uh, is in need of change and we've actively looked backwards for the answers, which is pushing us towards a tipping point, which I think will come pretty soon for this transition from stage five to six. Within the next few years, we'll probably see a couple of major tipping points that, that push us over the edge. And then what will happen is uh, stage six will become globally dominant. So we'll see stage six uh, social systems and stage six values and those sorts of things uh, being adopted commonly around the world. Um, and, and in the process of that change, what's happening simultaneously is our systems from stage five, the modern world, so our economic systems, our political systems, etc., are in decline because they can't cope with the complexity anymore. 
uh, and, and we can see that, if you look carefully, you can see that parallel process happening of the old systems declining while some amazing new technology and new thinking is rising at the very same time. So um, that change process then tips, once the tipping points are reached, it takes us uh, through a chaotic phase for any kind of system, whether it be human values and thinking or a social system like economics, for any kind of system to change, it must first loosen up or break down sufficiently for it to be able to rejig itself. And if you think of a, a child's toy made from Lego blocks, um, you know, if you build a ship out of blocks, you can't suddenly change it into an airplane without pulling the blocks apart and repositioning them. And, and that's what's got to happen to, to us as individuals in terms of our thinking and our neural networks, et cetera, our, our body chemistry, uh, and also to our society on a global scale. We have to, we have to fall apart sufficiently for there to be enough um, capacity to reshape things. So we should expect in the next few years uh, some relatively chaotic times where old systems are failing, new systems aren't quite ready to take over yet. Um, there ought to be a feeling of floating in the between space where we're not quite sure what the values are, we're not quite, quite sure what the systems are, um, and that happens both at a personal level and a, a, a large-scale global social level. Uh, and then inevitably there is uh, a breakthrough where things start to crystallise at a personal and global level. Um, and when that happens, all of a sudden we are energised because it's like we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We suddenly know what, where our values are headed. Uh, where society is headed, um, and uh, there is just a, a natural uh, energization. So we feel energized to move in that direction, to create new things, and to build a new world. Um, and then after a period of integration, uh, things will stabilize again. And so we'll find ourselves um, in a period of, of relative stability uh, where the values seem okay, everything seems to be working okay. Um, and I guess we can think back to times in the modern era where that's been the case, uh, and, and I guess, you know, maybe uh, in the 1980s, you know, when everything seemed to be booming and the stock market was doing well and, you know, people were living a good life, uh, wasn't too much warfare, um, that would be an example of, of a stable time in the previous paradigm. So that takes us to stage six, and now there are two more stages that Graves mapped, um, and something extremely significant happens between stage six and stage seven. Um, if you look at the scope of change between the first six stages, you'll find that it's relatively uniform. You can look at each stage transition and see that there was very significant change, but you know it's, it kind of equates to the other changes between the other stages in those first six. But when Graves, is, Graves looked at the data from uh, his study on people who'd shifted from six to seven, um, the degree of change was off the scale. It was like a quantum leap in capacity. And um, one of the things that happened was, um, as his data showed that as people moved through these first six stages, they weren't actually discrete stages, but in fact, they were more like layers that were being added to human capacity. And if you think of uh, the layers on an onion, that kind of thing, or perhaps those, those Russian babushka dolls which fit inside each other. And so as a new stage emerged, it was layered over the previous stages and there was this dynamic, which is where the, the name for the spiral dynamics book came from, um, this spiraling dynamic where people would be moving or growing up through stages, but if their life conditions changed subtly, they, they could quickly move back to operate from a previous stage. And in fact, in everyday life, we all do this. We, we might go to work and we operate from a particular level of complexity and then we'll go home and spend time with family and we'll be operating from a completely different level, maybe stage two, um, you know, tribalism kind of uh, interactions where it's really all just about a very basic family connection and the family relationships and, and those sorts of things. Uh, then we might go and play sport on the weekend and we might be operating from stage three, which is based around power and com you know, competition and, or stage five, which might be a sophisticated game with lots of strategy and those sorts of things. 
So you can start to get this idea of how um, this is not a fixed process where we're moving discreetly from one stage to another. It's a process of adding capacities on top of each other and then uh, developing a kind of artist's palette where we have all of these capacities inside us and we can shift and move and use them as life conditions dictate to solve the problems that we need to solve. Uh, and so by the time we reach stage six, we've, we've got six layers of different ways of being human that we have access to. Typically, people will operate from around three of those for most of their time. One, they'll be centred on. One, they'll be just moving out of. So, so say they might be centred on stage five, modern behaviour. They'll be, they'll be part of them that's still hanging on to stage four, um, this uh, linear kind of thinking, absolutistic stage. Uh, and that could be, for example, uh, a religious practice. And there'll, there'll be another part of their personality which is entering stage six, which is exploring something beyond the modern paradigm, um, you know, postmodern values uh, and, and social structures and, and those sorts of things. So that's, that's typically um, how we seem to be, uh, which is very complex. And the more you go into this, this model, the more complex it gets. Um, so back to this, this uh, shift from six to seven, which Graves found was like a quantum leap in human capacity. In fact, he called it um, a momentous leap. In an article he wrote for Futurist magazine in 1974. Uh, and so the characteristics of that are, first of all, we go through this change process again in between the stages. And because this shift from stage six to stage seven is seemingly the biggest shift in human history, um, it's also a big change process. So it takes us through what is potentially the biggest dark night of the soul uh, that we've ever experienced. And stage six plays a very important role in preparing us for that. So part of what typically happens during our, our living out of, of this postmodern relativistic stage six is that we have a heart opening and many people report it's like we can feel the entire world and the weight of the entire world in our shoulders. Uh, and I can remember my own experience of this feeling like um, I wanted to cry, but I didn't know why I wanted to cry. Uh, it, was, it didn't seem to be a personal thing. It seemed to be a transpersonal thing. Uh, and that's, so that's typically happening around stage six and preparing us for the transition to seven. Um, something else that happens at stage six is there's a strong drive to want to explore our inner self. And so we end up going on a journey of revisiting all of our previous stages and tending to any healing that needs to be done. So maybe from childhood traumas, maybe from you know, traumas from uh, our, our working life. Um, and typically... We want to do that in a group setting. So even though it's very much a personal exploration, we want to do it with reference to a group. So often it'll be in a, in a group therapy kind of a situation. It might not be formal therapy. It might be just having a coffee with people in a cafe. But we want to be with a group of peers who are like-minded. We want to hear about their hardships and their traumas and their inner journey. We want to use that information to interpret and to heal our own. Uh, and, and obviously also at stage six, there's a massive exploration of healing modalities. And so the whole new age movement is something that's come out of stage six. Um, and we can trace the early emergence of stage six back to, back to about the 1800s. Uh, the 1960s and 70s were a large wave, a big surge in this kind of uh, behaviour, which at the time didn't have enough scaffolding to hold it up. And so it got beaten back down by the modern paradigm. Um, but this time now there is the internet and so that's like a scaffold that it can hang on to. It's, it's a formalisation and, and a concrete representation of this need to be networked and to reference other people. Um, and so many of the, you know, the, the healing uh, centres and, and belief systems and cults and, and spiritual uh, paths that are present at the moment uh, are operating according to this uh, stage six worldview. And that healing process, um, what it's doing is it's firming up a platform that we can jump off. 
uh, to make this big leap that Claire Graves is talking about. So once we've we've healed ourselves sufficiently and that platform is is sufficiently solid, and our life conditions have become sufficiently complex, then we can begin this huge transition to stage seven. So stage seven brings a multi-dimensional way of viewing the world. And when we're in the first six stages, each stage is, is kind of like being a fish in a fishbowl where you're immersed in the water, but you can't really see the water. You don't know the water's there. So you might be immersed in one of the stages. But you can't see the other stages. You just know that your way of living seems to be right for you. Um, there's a tendency to reject people who are living from different value sets in other stages, and, and this is really the source of all the conflict in the world. So if we're living at stage five, we feel like our way of living is right. We know that there are people who are living um, quite differently to us who believe in strange religions or they're very violent or they just don't understand us. Um, but we don't have the capacity when we're in stage one through six to understand that we're looking at people at different stages of development. All we see is difference. And we, there is this inbuilt rejection factor where we just don't want to have them impose on us. And sometimes we feel driven to impose on them and try and make them like us. So, you know, maybe if we invade their country and take over their government and install a democracy, they'll be like us and everything will be fine. Uh, but obviously that doesn't work very well. But what happens when we move to stage seven is that rejection factor falls away. We become um, naturally accepting and understanding that there are different value sets in the world. And for the first time, we can literally sense and interpret the presence of different stages of development. So we develop this interdimensional capacity to understand that some people are actually living in very different worlds, even though we're all sharing the same physical space here on planet Earth, people are actually living in difficult world, in different worlds and difficult worlds side by side uh, with very different sets of values, very different motivations <clears throat> and very different understandings of reality. So um, many people when they arrive at stage seven and we're still talking about a very small percentage of, of people at this stage in history. So bearing in mind that the dominant paradigm globally is stage five, the modern paradigm at the moment. We seem to be in transition to stage six, uh, but we haven't reached that tipping point in terms of numbers yet. It's probably close. But if you look around the world, you can also see that we've got a lot of people still living according to stage four um, who have lives that are centered around religions, for example. We're still living in a world where there's a lot of people operating from stage three, the egocentric power-based existence. You can look at countries like Somalia, Afghanistan, and others where there are still warring clans that are dominating life in, in parts of those countries. Um, we, we still have many people living tribal lives. Um, you know, if you look around the South Pacific, places like Papua New Guinea, uh, Africa, in, in certain places, and other countries, you'll see traditional tribal life still exists. So uh, maybe hunter-gatherer, we're not so sure that that pure hunter-gatherer existence still exists now. Probably not, um, except maybe some people who are um, homeless and, and perhaps mentally ill um, in Western society could be classed as hunter-gatherers. But um, certainly from stage two through six, there are strong representations of all these stages uh, still existing around the world because the complexity of life conditions is different in different places. And so um, from stage seven, suddenly you can see this. Um, it becomes apparent. And suddenly you can see that when people are in the, some of these previous stages, you know, they, they tend to be in conflict with other stages. They're, they have this rejection factor going on. Um, and human nature starts to make much more sense but because there's still a relatively small number of people who are operating from stage seven and above um, you tend to feel quite like an outsider like uh, even to the point where it's like you've arrived on a different planet and uh, you know the, the people who are living here don't seem to make sense in their behavior but at the same time there's this tremendous acceptance and understanding 
something else that happens is fear drops away significantly. So in the first six stages, fear is a strong driver and, and there are different fears at different stages. Um, but at stage seven, that seems to drop away and you still feel fear, so it doesn't disappear, but it's no longer a major motivator. And so there's a tremendous freedom that comes from that, a freedom of action. And there's a disentanglement, a psychological and emotional disentanglement from connection with these previous six stages. So those six stages are still there inside you, but their influence reduces significantly. And so that creates a tremendous amount of psychological space and emotional freedom, which contributes to this tremendous capacity that happens uh, when people transition to stage seven. And um, it's difficult to, to analyze somebody without really talking to them in detail. So I'm hesitant to give examples, but certainly from a distance, someone like Elon Musk uh, is showing indications of having this stage seven capacity where he seems to be achieving just way, way, way more than any individual usually does, you know, and, and not just in one particular field of uh, investigation, but across many different disciplines. So a very diverse, a very capable uh, human being who seems to have tremendous imagination and capacity to create. And, and that's the kind of thing that you ought to expect to see from somebody who transitions to stage seven. Um, and another indicator is a capacity to work with paradox. So paradox is paradox to most people uh, when they're operating in stages one through six. But from stage seven, paradox makes sense. And all of a sudden you'll see people doing things that seem to be the opposite of what you would expect if you were thinking from the rational mind, um, and yet they work. Uh, and so that, ease of understanding and working with paradox is, is another characteristic of stage seven behavior. Um, also, if we look at stages one through three, the, the way of being that associated with those stages is primarily pre-rational. So the main drivers are instincts and urges, and we tend to be very much in the moment. From stage four, which came with the agricultural revolution, through stage six, the rational mind is dominant. So this is nested, again, just like the stages. So you have the rational-minded capacity fitting over the top of this pre-rational way of being. And the rational mind can literally rationalise. So we can feel fear, we can feel hunger, but we can tell ourselves from the rational mind, well, I can't be fearful because it will have consequences or I can't bother about being hungry at the moment because there are more important things to do. And so um, we're operating from that rational mind and dominance in stages four, five, and six, and still very much in that space on a global scale now. So in this transition from stage six to seven, we're moving from rational mind and dominance to operate in a trans-rational way. And during that change process, inevitably there is a zone of confusion that we navigate where we're moving to operate beyond the rational mind. So we're moving to something that's not rational. And the only prior reference point we have to that is our experience in the pre-rational world where we're operating from urges and instincts and fears and those sorts of things. So inevitably we confuse um, pre-rational inputs with transrational inputs. And you see this a lot in the, the New Age movement where people are presenting information which in part seems to be extremely valuable and extremely sophisticated and advanced. Um, but some of it seems to be quite primitive, superstitious and fear-driven at the same time. And this, so this is evidence of somebody who's creating in this confusion zone what trans, uh, Ken Wilber called the pre-trans fallacy zone. And I think this is very relevant to the work that you're doing, Ethan, uh, trying to present some of this new information in a grounded way and, and get beyond the, the pre-rational stuff. So what we have to do is we have to learn to discern between our, our fears and what that feels like in our body and our higher intuition, which is developing at that time, and what that feels like. 
when it comes through. And eventually we, we are successful and we get to the point where we, we know how to discern between what's just fear driven and what is actually higher knowledge uh, coming through a very deep intuitive process. And so once we reach uh, and are stable in stage seven, um, we're operating from that transrational space. So we can still be rational, we can still be pre-rational. If our life conditions change, if we get put under pressure, we'll flip backwards and forwards. Um, we can still descend down to being entirely pre-rational and, and aggressive and those sorts of things under certain life conditions. But when we're stable and comfortable, uh, we have a very advanced way of operating. And, uh, and as I said before, perhaps Elon Musk is an example of what that looks like. Yeah, so uh, what Graves found during his nine years of research was that some of the people who had shown up as operating from stage seven actually changed. And at first he thought he'd made a mistake interpreting the data and he went back and looked at it all again. He, um, he tried to compare the data to some of the previous stages, thinking that maybe he'd misidentified this shift. And what he found was that these people who changed from stage seven had changed back to a communal way of being, um, stage seven being individualistic. And they were most like the tribal stage too, yet they were operating in a much, much more complex way. Um, and he eventually realized that this was a new stage, an eighth stage, but it seemed to share themes with stage two, which was tribalism. And so that prompted him to look at stage seven again, and he realized that some of the things in stage seven um, had things in common with stage one, which was hunter-gatherer existence. So he deduced that there was a recurrence of themes. It was like the themes started over again from stage seven. And whereas hunter-gatherers were focused on survival at a small group level, People at stage seven were also focused on survival, but survival of our species on a global level seemed to be an important issue for them. Uh, and stage eight was also tribal, but whereas people at stage two were tribal at a local level within uh, local tribal boundaries, stage eight represented a global tribe where the earth was the sacred land, the whole planet, and humanity was the tribe. Um, and it was, it was much, much more complex at stage eight. Out of 1,065 people he studied, only six people showed up at stage eight, so a very, very small percentage. Uh, consequently, he didn't gather a lot of data, couldn't really define it very well. Um, he did say that it was an almost mystical way of existence. It seemed to have a very strong spiritual uh, way of operating. It um, looked at the world in a very organic way, uh, the work of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the, uh, the priest who came up with the idea of the noosphere of the whole planet having uh, um, a layer like the ionosphere, but which represented global thought, um, was the kind of thinking that seemed to be evident at stage eight. Um, and seeing ourselves as like a, a cell in the body of a very large being, which was the planet. Uh, and, you know, playing our own role, our own specialist role in the existence of the planet in the same way that a cell does in a body. Um, but that was really, you know, all he could glean from such a small amount of data. Um, so that, that was uh, where his research finished. No one has really continued it uh, in any significant way uh, till now. If you look at the time scales that he mapped, there ought to be more stages evident on, on the planet uh, by now. Uh, but we, we haven't really had a chance to identify or define them at all. But, but the model does take us really three paradigms beyond where we are right now, which is the value that I see in it uh, as a futurist and, and as somebody who is interested in preparing our species for this huge transition that we are uh, just beginning to go through, which is going to take us to the dominance of stage six. Uh, it's going to take us through that global healing process but it's also at the same time going to build complexity and evolutionary tension to the point where we're going to be um, rocketed across this massive shift in consciousness to stage seven at a, at a species level in the not too distant future. Um, 
whereas the agricultural stage took thousands of years, we know the modern stage took hundreds of years, the, uh, the postmodern or relativistic stage six is likely to take decades. And uh, I think it's, it's almost going to seem like a period of continual change rather than stability as we move through the next couple of decades with the emergence of stage six and then a very, very rapid increase in complexity, which is going to rocket us across to uh, a significant uh, tipping point into stage seven. You mentioned how stage six started expressing on a species level right in the 1800s, right? Is that, am I remembering that correctly? That's right, yeah. Okay, and, uh, and so now we're at a point where in the next few years it's going to catapult to where it's going to be the dominant stage collectively. So, so we're looking at what about uh, 150, 200 year period of time for that stage? Uh, yeah, thereabouts. You know, the, the most significant early uh, representations were things like uh, civil rights movements, which emerged around the middle of the 1800s, uh, women's rights, uh, black rights, those sorts of things, were certainly um, evidence of relativistic thinking. Um, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, he was operating from that stage when he came up with that theory, although he seems to have progressed beyond stage six later in life. Some early signs of stage seven came around the turn of the century, around 1900, with the emergence of quantum mechanics, uh, developmental psychology, which is a branch of psychology that acknowledges the existence of stages in human development. Um, there were some of the early signs there. And uh, so do you anticipate stage six being about a 200-year period of time as a whole? Or, or when, when do you think stage six will on a species level, shift to stage seven? We seem to be operating on a kind of logarithmic scale in terms of the first emergence of a stage and the transcendence to the next stage. And we know that the agricultural era spanned many thousands of years. I think some of the early discoveries now are putting it back to 10 or 12,000 years before the present time. Um, we can only imagine that the previous stages took longer. We know that humanity emerged as a species you know, roughly about 200,000 years ago, or at least that's what science knows right at the moment. If we look at the modern paradigm, stage five, we can see that it only took uh, a few hundred years. Uh, some of the earliest signs of its emergence were um, the, the Gutenberg printing press, uh, which was probably about 800 years ago, roughly, um, very early sign, and then serious uh, tipping points with the scientific and industrial revolutions around the 1800s. Um, and around that same time, we were seeing the early signs of stage six in the mid-1800s. So if agricultural took thousands of years, if modern took hundreds of years, it kind of looks like stage six, postmodern relativistic, ought to take just decades, and I, I personally think it could be as short as two decades of dominance from that particular paradigm, so not very long at all. Uh, and um, part of stage six's uh, brief, really, is to prepare us for this big leap to seven. That means building evolutionary tension, so it means that while stage six is dominant, we're going to see a lot of tension in the world, a lot of complexity, uh, and there needs to be sufficient tension to drive this bigger shift, uh, which is without precedent, really. The only precedent that I can think of for this shift from six to seven is perhaps the shift when we first became human from where to whatever we were before that. Um, so I, to answer your question, you know, probably a couple of decades in my reading, um, and then the question remains, what happens after the big shift? You know, does the clock reset? Um, do we go back to long periods of stability? Um, it's hard to know. So a couple of decades from when? From now? Yeah. Okay. And then the seventh stage will probably just be a decade or less, I would imagine, right? So very quick. Uh, yeah. Well, it's hard to say because we don't really know that much about stage seven. You know, we, we're only just starting to see organizations that are potentially operating from stage seven, we don't really understand what it's going to look like when it comes to maturity as a paradigm. 
Um, and uh, because of the multi-dimensional nature of the emergence of stage seven, you know, what happens to us when we go across this, this change uh, process to seven, it's hard to know how our understanding of time will be uh, and how that might reflect on human existence. It could be that the clock resets and we re return to periods of long stability. And certainly there are some wisdom traditions that are suggesting that, that we're moving into this golden age where we're going to see a long period of peace. That's quite possible. Um, but again, you know, if we look backwards, we see this logarithmic scale of, of uh, time that just is getting shorter and shorter and, and, you know, that might take us in a different direction. I, I really can't say at the moment. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Now, do you think that, si that well, I've noticed as the, this stage six has been coming into place, there's a, there are more and more people who are getting interested in psychedelics and, uh, for example, the use of ayahuasca is becoming very popular and more mainstream, well, not really really mainstream, but certainly in, in more spiritually minded people. And of course, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it was in the 60s and 70s that the sixth stage really got uh, propelled forward. So do you think there's any connection with the use, or rather, are the use, is the use of psychedelics in any way representative of this sixth stage getting underway? I, I do think it is. Uh, I think if you look at the what we think is the, the first psychedelic uh, revolution in the 1960s, that was certainly an indicator. Um, there, there are people who are suggesting that psychoactive plants have played a role in human evolution from the very start. Um, one of the theories is known as the stoned ape theory, and I know that Graham Hancock and, and Dennis McKenna both talk about that. The possibility that uh, pre-humans uh, discovered psychoactive mushrooms and that was part of their transition process into uh, human consciousness. Um, so it's likely that uh, altered states have always played a role in human change. Um, there's some great work uh, being done around analysing cave art that looks at the type of art that we find and it seems pretty clear that many of the things that people drew on cave walls resulted from altered states of consciousness, like, for example, representations of half-human, half-animal beings, which we really don't see. You know, we never found a, a skeleton of one of those beings, so we can only assume that these are things that people saw in visions during altered states. Claire Graves wrote that whenever people are going through periods of significant change, uh, they always turn to drugs of some sort, you know, and, and we can look back in history and see the use of alcohol and, uh, you know, various other drugs. Um, and certainly in the 1960s, we saw a big upsurge in the use of psychedelics. Um, and the, the, multi the multidimensional nature of the, the states that we achieve from psychedelic drugs is extremely relevant to this transition from stage six to seven, uh, I can say that for sure, um, and uh, also seems to have played a very significant role in the emergence of stage six, uh, if we look at the 1960s and 70s as an example. And even though psychedelic drugs became illegal in the early 70s in most places around the world, um, the use didn't disappear. So the use of psychedelic drugs has continued. It's just continued in an underground way, and so it's been out of sight, you know, in many ways, but still quite widespread, I believe. And from what I can see at the moment, I think the spread of ayahuasca around the world is playing quite a big role, uh, more than we know, in our transition at the moment. And uh, it looks set to, you know, continue expanding. Are you familiar with the sharing economy? Yes. Okay. Do you think that, well, that for those viewers who may not be familiar, I'm referring to the uh, the prevalence of well really what started as with the the internet as a backbone but um, but the prevalence of more and more sharing economy type of um, businesses out there and just a general way of living such as um, Uber and Airbnb and um, 
uh, even new forms of currency such as Bitcoin and things like that are shifting the way that we interact with each other and, and from a economic model. So for example, previously where if we want to stay in a different town or city where we visit, we would rent a hotel where now we may rent a room from somebody else who's an individual living in their own house. So the economic model seems to be shifting. Do you see that as a representation of the seventh stage or, or a sixth stage? It's very clearly a representation of stage six. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, there's this rejection factor which shows up in stages one through six where as people move from one stage to the next, um, they very strongly reject the previous stage and part of their own change process is coming to this place of feeling like the old way of living is really wrong, the values are wrong and we have to change. And so if we look at stage five, the modern paradigm, some of the things that it's done is it's uh, been based around personal success and the outcome of that has been we have a very small percentage of people in the world who become very rich and very successful and the other 99%, as they say, uh, who are on top of the pile. Uh, and so as people are transitioning to stage six, they're looking at that and feeling like that is really wrong and that needs to change. And consequently, there's this great um, motivation to want to redistribute resources. And in general, that strategy is uh, applied across all disciplines by stage six. The, the way of fixing problems is to rebalance things. The world is out of balance, is the mindset of stage six. And so part of that is redistributing wealth. Uh, so we're, we're seeing some progressive countries now start to look at the idea of the minimum wage where everybody gets given some money regardless, you know, whether they're working or not, just to try and rebalance this imbalance that's occurred as a result of the modern way of living. Um, and, of course, um, the materialistic nature of stage five is also being rejected strongly. So rather than accumulating a whole bunch of stuff, um, people are looking at sharing, which minimises the impact on the environment, you know, which is also an important focus of stage six um, and helps us repair what seems to be a broken world from the viewpoint of stage six where, you know, wealth is out of balance, uh, the world is being depleted of resources and um, there things that aren't fair. Some people have stuff and some people don't. So it's, it's, very, it's a very central uh, aspect of the emergence of stage six. Yeah. So you see more of a move toward the, the sharing type of economy than as we go from six to seven and so on? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so bearing in mind that these stages are nested inside each other, the old paradigms don't disappear. You know, we can look around the world and see um, stages two and three and four still evident. Um, stage five won't be extinct. It'll still be around. There'll still be people who are operating in competitive uh, and modern ways. Um, but the dominance will shift to this uh, postmodern concept of, of sharing, as you say, and we'll see a distribution, a redistribution of wealth. We'll see systems put in place which uh, contain and restrain the exploitation that we see from stage five. Um, and uh, I think blockchain and the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and, and others are a great example of new technologies that are going to make it very difficult for stage five to be dominant. Uh, you know, on a large scale. Um, it'll, I'm sure it will still be dominant on a local scale in, in many places, but globally, the stage six systems are, um, as Buckminster Fuller would have said, you know, these are the systems that make the old ways obsolete. Um, yeah. What do, you, what do you see happening to our governmental structure then as we move into stage six more fully in the next 20 years and into stage seven and seven and eight? Um, that's a really interesting question. What I'm seeing is a decline in the importance of the nation state. So the idea of a nation state emerged with stage five in the modern paradigm. Prior to that, uh, we lived in a world of, of empires and kingdoms and uh, people, you know, um, royal families owned large areas of land and uh, 
conquered other pieces of land and those sorts of things. Um, and so the, the nation state is a relatively new uh, phenomenon and already we're seeing uh, evidence of its decline in importance. Uh, and so um, we had the experiment of the European Union, uh, you know, which networked together a whole bunch of countries and, and started to establish a kind of sharing economy of sorts. Um, and and you, we should see that as a prototype you know, of early stage six, uh, which got corrupted to some extent by stage five uh, and seems to be falling apart at the moment. Um, and uh, warfare is another good example of the decline of the importance of a nation state because we've got a, a war on terror going on at the moment, um, which is not a war against the nation state. It's a war against an idea or a value set. <clears throat> um, so I see that trend continuing. Uh, again, you know, these old paradigms don't necessarily disappear, but I think the importance of nations will uh, reduce. We'll probably see more um, examples of things like the European Union, where groups of countries band together to work together um, and eventually some kind of a, a network, a sharing network that um, encompasses the whole world, I think, in the future. Um, and some of the technology that's coming out, uh, particularly blockchain at the moment, is showing us how that might happen. And, and again, uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies is something that sit over and above nation states. So uh, no one country owns those systems. No one country can stop those systems from operating. Um, and so there's a very, very clear trend there. In terms of government, um, we, there's a couple of significant things that need to happen. Uh, we need to restore a kind of democracy because democracy has been corrupted by the modern paradigm uh, in its uh, search for power and influence and success. We got to the point where at one point we had what was a reasonable democratic process, but now that's essentially been owned by the corporate world uh, through uh, political donations and, and uh, you know, economic control measures um, to the point where the people and the Occupy movement is a great example of this, you know, just don't feel like they're, they've got a, an active say in what happens anymore. So I think we'll, we'll see uh, a return to a kind of representative democracy. Uh, I think the system in Switzerland is probably... Um, quite progressive and it gives us an idea of how the people can take back some control of the democratic process without changing our system too much, uh, but just moving us away from, from what's really been hijacked uh, by corporate influence at the moment. Um, and then beyond that, beyond stage uh, six, what's going to happen is with this recognition of the stages of consciousness, it's really for the first time um, an opportunity or, or it's the place where humanity starts to understand the layered nature of consciousness from stage seven. So we'll start to see and be able to identify which groups of people and which individuals are operating from which levels of complexity. And so we'll be able to understand which level of complexity in terms of consciousness is most appropriate for which group of people living where on the planet. And so we might understand, for example, that people in a certain country are living amidst complexity of a certain degree, which makes a stage five government most appropriate for them and stage five systems. And we might note that another group of people in another country are living amidst complexity that equates to stage six. So stage six systems is, is are most appropriate for them. <clears throat> and so that will enable this customization uh, and very sophisticated um, stewardship of different groups of people around the world, all in the context of understanding the evolutionary journey that we're on, which is taking us through these stages, and also the dynamics of change and the importance of life conditions. And so I... I, th I think uh, once we reach a tipping point and we have um, systems of governance that, that sit in this, what Claire Graves called the second tier of consciousness, which is from stage seven onwards, um, you'll see uh, ideally uh, a governance 
advisory group, maybe a wisdom council, you could call it, established at a global level of the most capable conscious uh, human beings who were suited to that particular role. Um, and then uh, stewarding, um, you know, and, and playing a kind of a, a guidance process for different groups of people around the world, helping shape the life conditions in ways that nurture their own evolution um, in a most appropriate way for the, the complexity of the life conditions and the stage that they're at. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Now, a lot of people would be concerned about the, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, European, Union, European Union and this uh, idea of a global Illuminati and um, one new world order, one world government system. So if you're saying we're moving toward more systems like that, how, how is it different uh, than the way that the, the systems have been so far? It's different because as you move up through these stages of consciousness, each new stage is more inclusive and more comprehensive than the previous. So what that means in practical terms is that as people progress to a higher stage of consciousness, their sphere of interest and influence expands, their compassion expands, uh, and their understanding of wider humanity expands. When we cross over this big leap to second tier and stage seven, um, we, we get this multidimensional capacity. Uh, we've already, from stage six, got this capacity to put ourselves in the shoes of another human being and imagine what it feels like to live under their life conditions. And so by stage seven, we've got within ourselves, we've got all of the um, capacities and characteristics of the first six stages plus the seventh inside ourselves, um, which give us you know, the capacity to understand anybody who, who is existing in any of those stages, to connect with them directly, um, and an enormous capacity for compassion because not only has our heart opened at stage six to the point where we can feel the struggle of, of humanity as a whole. But from stage seven, um, we know the dynamics that are driving everybody, you know, through these stages. We understand uh, it, it's, it's like we can see the matrix, you know, like, like in the matrix movies where Neo can suddenly see the code. We understand the dynamics. We understand the nature of consciousness and we understand why people do what they do. And we understand how, Life conditions uh, are the, the major influence on the adaptation of consciousness and behavior. So it's just, you know, it's just something that sits beyond what most people can even imagine in terms of um, how compassionate and how capable people can be at these higher stages. What's happening at the moment is many people are in this confusion zone that I mentioned before this pre-trans fallacy zone, as Ken Wilber calls it, where they're mixing fearful information from their pre-rational selves with an element of uh, higher intuition or trans-rational input. And one of the, the things that's happening there is they're painting these terribly fearful pictures of uh, a world dominated by people who are pre-rational, who are greedy, egocentric, impulsive, uh, and they're pushing that picture into the future to, to imagine this future where, um, you know, we're controlled by tyrants who aren't capable of compassion or, or even rational reasoning. Um, and while that may be actually true, you know, of some examples at the moment, uh, particularly when we're in this regressive phase of change where we're looking backwards to old values to help drive us through the transition from five to six, uh, it certainly won't be true in the future if we continue our evolution as a species. And there's no reason to think that we won't continue unless, uh, you know, we destroy ourselves in, in the meantime as we're trying to navigate these difficult changes. Um, so I, I think the kind of scenarios of uh, controlling Illuminati that are being painted are largely driven by fear. Um, and it's pretty easy to discern that, you know, if you just listen to what people are saying and how they're saying it, you can, you can sense whether they're really spreading fear 
or whether they are actually talking in an expansive and conscious way about the future. Um, and I'd encourage people to, you know, to start to be quite discerning about their sources in, in that respect. Um, and, and these theories, again, are simply a reflection of the individual who is uh, communicating at the time and where they are in their journey. And many of them, as I said, are in this confusion zone uh, where they're having trouble discerning fear from higher intuition. Now we're seeing a tremendous amount of technological innovation in the world. And, for example, we have cars that drive themselves very soon that are going to be prevalent on our, uh, especially in the United States in the near future. And they have uh, robots delivering food in California and possibly the mail very soon. Now, a lot of people are concerned with the transhuman agenda and also what will happen with artificial intelligence as it becomes more advanced and whether we will end up creating a superior race that that um, overtakes the human race. Do you have an opinion on that? I do, yeah. Um, there are a number of interesting issues that arise around that topic. Um, <clears throat> one of them is, one of the, the most significant challenges we've faced as a species so far comes from uh, what I call the trickle down of technology. So technology that is developed at the leading edge of human consciousness but once it's produced, it becomes available to people who are at previous stages of consciousness. Uh, and one example would be the invention of uh, machine guns, um, you know, which came out of the modern paradigm. But yet, once they were produced and distributed, they became available to people who were still living in tribal life conditions, people who were living in egocentric warlike life conditions. Um, and, and so the degree of moral development of the people who produced the technology um, didn't match the moral development of the people who had access to the technology. And, uh, and we all know what the result of that has been. So that's something that we need to guard against as a species in the future. And this is, um, this is one of the, the growth pains that we've got to go through is realizing that because until we can start to realize on a larger scale, the layered nature of consciousness and the developmental process and the layered nature of morality, then we can't address the, the problem of um, new technologies becoming available to people who perhaps morally aren't well prepared to use the technology in constructive ways. Um, and, and this is part of the, the uh, evolutionary tension that is going to build over the next couple of decades as stage six emerges and becomes dominant is this, this kind of thing is going to be happening where we're going to be seeing the emergence of extremely sophisticated technology which is coming from stage seven and maybe even beyond. Uh, and yet, until we get to the point where we realise that we have to somehow control access to that technology, um, we're going to run into the same technology trickle down issue, and and it, it you know could threaten the survival of our species. I mean, it already has. Um, you know, we've been through cold wars with nuclear weapons and those sorts of things. So that's one of the big challenges, and it's going to be one of a number of big challenges that create sufficient evolutionary tension to the point where we have no choice as a species but to make this quantum leap and evolve to a higher point where we can get beyond all of that stuff which threatens our survival. Um, in terms of artificial intelligence, I think um, a couple of things. Um, firstly, on robotics, uh, robotics will eventually free us up from what we now know as the rat race. So the modern paradigm has created a rat race where we have to work flat out uh, all week to earn enough money to afford to live weekend and then go back to work again. And uh, what robotics is going to do is it's going to reduce the cost of living significantly. So instead of things being manufactured in large factories in countries overseas, um, you know, we'll have uh, a return to a certain level of uh, local manufacture using 3D printing. Um, and the cost of living is going to drop dramatically. So if you think about the cost of you know, building a factory in China, for example, uh, employing people there um, and then shipping goods around the world, uh, the cost of retail outlets to have to sell those goods, um, the transport uh, locally, um, and the time that we have to spend you know, shopping and sourcing things, 
a lot of that is going to change dramatically where we can just uh, send a message to a local 3D printer or maybe even have one in our home and produce the item locally. Uh, and the net effect of that and the knock-on effect of that to other industries will mean that it's going to be um, very inexpensive to live. Uh, we're going to see probably the spread of this minimum uh, wage idea where people, everybody will be distributed a certain amount of resources to live with without having to work all week to get them. Um, and while there is certainly going to be some grief during the transition process as factories close down but the localised stuff hasn't developed properly yet, once it's stabilised, we're going to live in a world where we have much more free time, much more recreational uh, time and access to recreational things, um, easy access to everything that we need to live. And, you know, it's just going to transform life uh, incredibly. So, so the end result, I think, is going to be wonderful from an evolutionary point of view. Um, but again, we have to navigate the transition. Um, and this goes right back to me uh, mentioning at the start about, um, you know, getting a message to help establish a network of people uh, with the capacity to help guide us through this serious and chaotic change time that we're about to, to embrace. Uh, and I think that it, that is really important. And the faster we can do that as a species is, you know, organise ourselves at a global level from a higher level of consciousness um, in a grounded, practical way where, whereby we can solve big problems very quickly as they arrive using, you know, the most uh, conscious capacity that we have, um, the easier the transition is going to be for us as a species. So I think that is, is quite important and quite critical. Um, artificial intelligence, just quickly, uh, I don't think we really understand much at all about human consciousness yet. Uh, most people who are working, if not all, uh, on artificial intelligence at the moment are imagining creating or recreating the human mind using an electronic uh, circuit. Um, whereas recent discoveries, uh, particularly the work of Penrose and Hammeroff, tell us that there's a whole other communication system in our brain which is based on microtubules, which are very small tubes uh, filled with liquid and which seem to communicate using uh, electromagnetic radiation or waves, um, which sits, um, is no doubt complementary and part of our overall uh, brain's operation, but it's, it's not you know, electric. Um, and it's, a, it's an entirely new and extremely complex system that we've discovered. And so um, the degree of complexity of the human mind uh, is far beyond anything that we've even imagined yet. Um, so, you know, I'm not concerned about us uh, creating intelligence that outstrips our own capacity in the near future. I mean, it may come. But uh, for now, I think we're, we're still in kindergarten in terms of understanding and, and creating artificial intelligence. And you've only got to look around at the examples that exist now, um, and none of them could really do anything without being programmed. Um, you know, I, I don't see any threat in the, the immediate future from that, uh, that place. And, and there are other factors too. I mean, one of the, if you look at the repeating themes between the first tier stages and the second tier stages, um, from tribalism at stage two to egocentric warlike behavior at stage three, we broke out of the tribal boundaries and we discovered people uh, existing beyond the tribal boundaries. Now, if you project that into advanced consciousness in the second tier, uh, the, the tribal themes occur at stage eight, which is this um, global thinking stage. Uh, and at some point, we've got to break out of those boundaries, which, which indicates that we're going to break out of living on planet Earth and that we're most likely going to encounter life beyond planet Earth. Uh, and there are many, many people uh, around now who are talking about uh, contact with extraterrestrials in an interdimensional or psychic way. Um, I've also had that kind of contact uh, for some years now, uh, sporadically. Um, and I expect that at some point, maybe in the not too distant future, life on Earth will be stable enough uh, that we can have uh, proper contact with uh, life from beyond planet Earth. Uh, and 
and most likely life that is more consciously evolved than we are. Um, so you've got to factor that in as well. Uh, at some point, you know, I, I expect we'll have uh, conscious technological input from, um, from extraterrestrial species, uh, which will, again, you know, transform uh, being human in ways that we probably can't even imagine yet. We've had a lot of uh, very gifted intuitives on this show and people who have had extraterrestrial contact in physical form as well as uh, who are channels for extraterrestrial consciousness. And I'm seeing that more and more people, it seems like exponentially every year, are experiencing substantial spiritual growth and awakening to different gifts and abilities that are very out of the ordinary. Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of gifts and abilities or things like that do you foresee happening as the sixth stage and the seventh stage and so on pick up? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, with the emergence of stage six, one of the things that people report is this heart opening process. And uh, I was talking to Greg Braden just recently who mentioned uh, some research that's just about to be published by uh, the heart math people where they did a study monitoring heart uh, resonance in, in a, a group of people who were spread around the world and involved in many, many different activities. And they found a group within the study set who were in resonance with each other at a heart level, despite the fact that they weren't co-located. So they were spread widely around the world, involved in different activities, but their heart data was in resonance, which is quite a remarkable finding. And uh, while you know it's early days, um, it's tempting to think that that is a characteristic of stage six, because people report feeling like they can uh, sense in their heart um, particularly the trauma of humanity, you know, the whole of humanity at times, and, and people being moved to, to weep for, um, you know, the, the trials and tribulations of humanity as they're uh, passing through stage six. Sort of suggests that there is a large-scale resonance that's going to be occurring there, and it already is occurring, you know, for those people who are in that place. Um, so I think uh, stage six brings a large-scale resonance. Uh, it brings a capacity to feel beyond the individual um, and uh, a very strong compassion in the sense that the Dalai Lama talks about compassion, you know, as being an important uh, trait to nurture. Um, and also we see stage six exploring belief systems very widely. So um, I, I think... Stage six brings a capacity to, to very easily put yourself in another person's shoes and to imagine what it's like to be a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian or uh, whatever um, you know, particular spiritual path people are, are walking. Um, so certainly there are, there are higher capacities there in terms of compassion uh, and understanding and uh, perspectives. And, and Ken Wilber has done some wonderful work describing how, as we move through each of these stages, we develop the capacity to take on more perspectives. So as we, as we evolve up the stages, it's taking us from a place of being just able to understand ourselves and being very egocentric to being able to understand the impact of our actions on another, um, to being able to understand um, you know, third and fourth and fifth uh, person perspectives and so on uh, and, and that's one of the key features of stage six is, is this capacity to take on more perspectives uh, and in stage seven like I said it, it's a quantum leap so we're going to see all sorts of interesting capacities developing in stage seven um, one of them being this capacity to suddenly see the layers of consciousness that we, we didn't even know were there before um, capacities to read another person's consciousness very quickly uh, and uh, I guess it's, it's kind of hard to describe how that might happen, but it's, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's a combination of all of our capacities as human beings, um, using all of our senses and perhaps new senses that are developing, where we can directly sense someone else's energy and very quickly uh, know what frequency they might be operating on. And it's quite possible to think of these stages of development 
uh, as different frequencies, uh, which are becoming you know, more higher, more fine frequencies as we go up through the stages. So I certainly think that stage seven brings this capacity to read people. Um, it brings a capacity to adapt our own frequency to match someone else's in a conscious way. Um, so to consciously read somebody, to consciously understand that, to, to meet somebody, um, we need to actually adjust our own frequency to their frequency and communicate with them through their own worldview so that they can fully understand what we're communicating. And to do that in a very genuine way, uh, in an authentic way, not in a way that might be artificial, like you might see from you know advertising people in stage five or something like that, but in a very authentic way. Um, and also something else that changes as we go up through these stages is our perception of time. And we know that when we're in an individualistic stage, so one, three, five, seven, there's a tendency to operate on a very well, or a relatively short time scale. Um, so in a corporate world, for example, in stage five, people rarely talk about corporate strategic plans that are any longer than sort of three or five years. That's a long time in a corporate world. Um, whereas if we look at the communal stages, two, four, six, and eight, uh, and the kind of uh, stories, myths, traditions that come out of those stages, they're generally long-term. And we see, you know, Indigenous people talking about time spans of thousands of years. Um, the Aboriginal people of Australia have traditional stories that are still being passed on, which are being linked back to historical events, climate events, which occurred tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and so in these communal stages, we tend to take a much, much uh, longer-term outlook. Um, at the higher stages, we're starting to think about time in terms of past lives and future lives uh, and, and present life. Uh, and also we're starting to think about life existence, consciousness in other dimensions of reality, uh, apart from our own uh, physical reality here on planet Earth. So all of these factors come into play uh, and all of them are representing different interpretations of reality and different ways of sensing reality that are unfolding with these higher stages. Yeah, it seems to me that these stages are all fractals within fractals. So, for example, some of the ancient civilizations from uh, 12,000 years ago and before that built a lot of the ancient structures like the pyramids and such were obviously at a very high stage of development. And, and as you mentioned earlier, there are a lot of ancient prophecies that point to us entering a period of a thousand or more years of peace or a golden age. So is that possible that there is a, a higher fractal of these cycles, uh, these stages that maybe we're entering into or will be entering into uh, that is a longer period of a period of eight stages within another single stage? It's quite possible, yeah. And uh, there are certain things about history which don't seem to make sense, uh, as I'm sure you, you uh, understand. When we look at some of the technologies, particularly the building technologies that we're uncovering uh, in the pyramids in Egypt and, and uh, structures in Turkey and other places, um, which suggests that we've had more complex capacities in some particular areas in the past that have been lost to us. And perhaps now you know, we're on the verge of regaining again. Uh, I think there are a number of different potential explanations for that. Um, some of the, the possibilities are that uh, these more complex civilizations uh, have been destroyed by climate events and, and knowledge lost in that way. Um, it's possible and, and I think likely that there has been extraterrestrial uh, involvement in early human development. Uh, and perhaps technologies that have been passed on to us at earlier stages, uh, which were lost for various reasons. And um, another factor is that, and this sort of takes us just a little bit more deeply into the complexity of, uh, of Claire Graves' model, is that in each individual we have different facets to our personality, and one of the ways of describing those is using the multiple intelligences theory, where you can say somebody has a rational, logical intelligence and they might have a musical intelligence, an emotional intelligence, a spiritual intelligence, um, a spatial intelligence, etc. 
And each one of those intelligences represents a line of development. And so some, uh, somebody, one individual can be at different stages of development on those different lines. And, and Ken Wilber's done some great work around this. Um, so uh, this adds complexity to the theory and it's, it's why I don't explain it up front like that. But, but once you dig deeper, you can see that one individual might be highly developed when it comes to spiritual intelligence, but not so developed when it comes to moral intelligence or spatial intelligence or something else. So in other words, they're in different places on this spiral of changes that I've been describing in different facets of their personality. And the development through those stages is directly related to the complexity of their life conditions in the relevant area, you know, as it applies to those lines of development in the personality. So one of the, one of the areas where we don't rely on our physical life conditions so much for development is spirituality. And we know that we can enter into altered states of consciousness and visit what seem to be other dimensions of existence um, and grow spiritually through that process. And that's something that's always been available to humanity. Um, so it's quite possible that some of these civilizations we see as being quite old uh, were actually quite developed spiritually because they had access to the life conditions of spirituality in those other dimensions of consciousness. And we can see in some of the, the evidence left behind in the pyramids and uh, the star chambers and, and various other things that they, they seem to have built structures designed very specifically for altered states where there was sensory deprivation, uh, where it, there was construction to enhance the resonance of sound within the space. Um, and, and, of course, often these places are accompanied by uh, rock carvings or... Um, wall freezes, you know, which describe spiritual processes of uh, birth and resurrection, which can happen in altered states, uh, quite separate to happening, you know, in physical form. Um, so it's quite likely, I think, that some of these uh, civilizations were perhaps more advanced than us in spiritual terms, and, and which is why we can look back to some of these amazing scriptures like the, the Vedas and some of the work from ancient Egypt and see very advanced spiritual technologies uh, and, and concepts which don't match, you know, the mainstream today. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not as simple as it seems. Um, it's, it's quite likely and, and really obvious that some things that happened in the past seem to be more advanced than things that are happening right now. And uh, who knows, you know, what's that, what that's going to look like in the future. So roughly how many more years do you see us going through this difficult period before, the, the, before we start seeing more of the positives of the six? Um, look, I, I think we're already seeing uh, some very positive things come out of the sixth stage. And I think cryptocurrencies and the blockchain system are, are an excellent example of that. Uh, and for those who haven't really um, followed the, the progress in that area, these... Um, internet-based systems have the capacity to fulfill many, many different functions within society, not just economic functions. Uh, although they've emerged as you know, economic tools already, people are building systems based on the blockchain, which could replace the functions of government and, and all sorts of things. Um, so um, as I said before, it's a parallel process. You know, we're, we're seeing decline on one hand and the rise of a new uh, era on the other. Um, I would expect that we'll see some, probably a series of, of two or three very major tipping points uh, within the next three years, maybe five years, um, which are going to push us over or, th or through the breakthrough point and see stage six emerging as dominant over stage five, so postmodern over modern. Um, once stage six emerges, <clears throat> One of the things that is already evident is that the world that a stage six consciousness creates is a very open world and a very permissive world. It's a world, for example, where everybody has access to the internet, which means everybody has access to all of the information um, you know, that's, that's come from human history, that all of the information that exists essentially. And so 
Um, this idea of the technology trickle down becomes a very significant factor where people whose moral development might be relatively low and simple have access to things that give them uh, great influential capacity. And we're seeing this already where uh, terrorist groups, for example, who uh, are carrying out barbaric acts are able to actually film those, put them on YouTube, and whereas 100 years ago, if they did something like that, they might have terrorised 50 people in a village, um, now they can terrorise the entire world via YouTube. And so the influence of each of the previous stages of consciousness rises up and becomes greater. So stage six is going to bring a set of life conditions where stage two, three, four, and five have equal capacity to influence the world uh, as stage six, essentially, because they can use the technology, they can get access, uh, they can do what they do and uh, get exposure to everybody on the planet through social media, etc. So what that's going to do is, um, and again, you know, we see the early seeds of this already, it's going to create uh, a very, very complex world where um, a large set of different values is in play simultaneously. And we as a, as a species struggle to know what the hell to do about that. How do we fix that? What do we do? Um, stage six, we know already, tends to solve problems by trying to rebalance things. So it operates. It likes to operate on a level playing field. It likes to assume that everybody is the same and it will try and move resources around to fix problems. Um, and that won't fix the problems I'm talking about. We already know that. That, that kind of strategy has been used for many, many years to try and fix uh, issues of starvation in Africa by simply moving food around. But the problems that create the starvation don't come from an absence of food. They come from conflict and other things. Um, so stage six tends to, even though it's, you know, it's more capable, much more capable than stage five, it tends, it tends to be blind to the multidimensional nature of the issues that we're facing. So this is why it is important to uh, establish some kind of stage seven capacity as quickly as we can as a species because it's only from stage seven that the answers to these complex problems can be found. So what we're going to see is, I, and this again is, is just my, um, my, my estimation, uh, is I think we'll see a decade or two of very rapid change of increase, increasing complexity where more people from more value sets, more stages, in other words, have greater influence on what's happening on the, in, on the planet. Um, we're going to see um, continuing conflict between the first six stages in terms of rejecting other worldviews and trying to, to make your own worldview dominant over others. Um, and uh, a period of regression, which we're entering into now, where people look backwards to older values uh, to try and find the answers to the problems because the, the current attempts aren't working. And what we're seeing now particularly is a regression to stage four values, which is very rigid black and white thinking uh, and insular nationalistic behaviour. And, and the Trump administration is, is an example of that where they're kind of shutting down, let's make America great again, do whatever America needs to do, uh, regardless of what impact that might have on the world. Um, you know, that's being moderated by Trump's uh, modern stage five um, elements where he doesn't want to close off the trade routes and, you know, he doesn't want to disadvantage competition and those sorts of things. So there's some moderation to that also. Um, and also, you know, some elements of stage three where we regress to the kind of find a bigger hammer solution to some of these problems. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, that's been well in play in terms of trying to deal with the, the global terror issue is we just need to drop bigger bombs, um, which we just did recently, <coughs> America did. So um, we should expect that. We should expect growing complexity. We should expect the problems to become tougher we should expect this uh, regressive behaviour of more rigid thinking, more fundamentalist thinking, uh, a rise in, in uh, 
find a bigger hammer type of thinking. So violence, you know, I think one of the, the big challenges we face is trying to contain our violent nature as a species and trying to make sure that this transition doesn't lead us through uh, another major war globally. Uh, I think that's a very big issue and something that we need to watch very, very closely. Um, and we, we have to endure this period of a decade or two of extremely rapid change because parallel to all of that regression and difficulty, we're going to be living at a time of extraordinary breakthroughs where across every discipline we're going to see new technologies that just blow our minds, you know. We're going to see um, uh, advances in space travel, advances in medical technology, most likely um, significant life extension. Um, and, and problems that potentially can solve with new technology anything that needs to be solved in the world to this, to this day. Um, and uh, because change happens locally in waves, and as I've been explaining uh, during the presentation, you know, we've seen the early emergence of these high levels of consciousness in little pockets in various places around the world over time. We can actually look around now and we can see little pockets of the future. And uh, the author, William Gibson, once said, you know, the future already exists, it just isn't evenly distributed. And that's really true. So we can look around now, we can see these new technologies. We can see that we actually have answers to most of the problems that we have right now. It's just that there isn't the motivation or the inclination or the level of consciousness uh, at, a, at a group level on a large scale to abandon our old motivations and absorb these new technologies to solve the problems right now. And, and that process is a matter of time. It's a matter of scale of the emergence of more people at these high levels of consciousness and of tipping points being reached and change processes rolling themselves out, you know, so that we can start to use some of the, the technology that we have right now that could solve most of the world's problems on a large scale. Uh, and then eventually, and it's hard to say when the stability will come, but I'm thinking probably sometime uh, in the 2030s maybe, we'll reach a point where we have sufficient global capacity at these higher levels of consciousness um, to adopt the new technologies, to adopt the new values and ways, to start really nurturing ourselves as a species and to know how to care for people regardless of what set of life conditions they, they live in or what um, set of values or level of consciousness that they need to operate effectively in those life conditions. We'll know how to, to nurture them under those life conditions. We'll know what works and uh, we'll know that we need to use different approaches for, for people who are operating in different places at different stages around the planet and come to some effective stability um, you know, whereby we'll, we ought to see uh, a large decline in human conflict, a large decline in human suffering uh, and um, great prosperity globally. And, uh, you know, it, it looks like from all the evidence, it looks like this period of, of stable peace that is being prophesized or has been prophesized for a long time. And, uh, and in that process, we'll create a world that's safe enough uh, for visitors to come from other planets perhaps um, without the danger of us firing nuclear missiles at them. And where can our viewers find out more about you and uh, your various websites and where you'll be doing events? My website is emanate.net, so that's E-M-A-N, the figure eight, dot net, uh, where I posted some information about uh, Clegg Race's theory and you can see some uh, images that represent the model. Um, I'm posting some recent talks there and uh, I'm, I'm I have been talking regularly at the Arlington Institute in Berkeley Springs. I'll be there on May 13 uh, to, to talk about the current state of the world in relation to this model. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm on Twitter uh, at SteveMC1, Steve Mac1. Um, and uh, I continue to update my website with, uh, with the latest and greatest. Um, and I'm just about to travel uh, to uh, the US, UK and Iceland and um, in Iceland, I'll be getting an update on this project that I mentioned earlier that my friends are developing to, to build a futuristic centre there, um, which uh, we're hoping will be a hub for the development of this global network and a hub for people to come together and talk about the future. 
um, to talk about uh, the evolution of human consciousness and some of the solutions that we need to, to uh, roll out over the coming years. And, and the plan is over the long term to build more of these places around the world and, and uh, support the network. Well, it's been great having you with me today on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on you and, and maybe we can have you out here uh, to speak as well in the future. Thank you, Ethan. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's uh, probably the first time I've had uh, the opportunity to talk uh, in a program like this at such length and detail about the work I'm doing and about uh, some of the, the uh, information that I'm working from. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Awaken and Power TV with my special guest, Steve McDonald. Join me next week as we speak with another incredible individual who's standing on the leading edge and changing the world.